a little bit. You got your Bible? Glory to God. Well, continuation from last time. Uh, we know that the Bible is the only thing that we can use to detect the enemy because it fully identifies his lineage, his actions, his characteristics, and his personality. We're talking about we come a long way from Nimrod, amen? And we're over here talking about the Antichrist. Um, and we've been getting into different types of his actions and how the Bible views him. And so we can basically get a description of this person. And we went through Cain, Nimrod, Pharaoh, uh, uh, Balak. We, we went to uh, Sisera and uh, Abimelech was the last one. Uh, we showed that he's a rebel who was killed by a blow on the head. And uh, do you remember that last week? Okay. And now we're to Absalom. And if you don't know who he is, he's the son of David, King David. And his name means the father of peace. Imagine that. And uh, he obtains the kingdom peaceably, but he does it by flatteries. Go to 2 Samuel 15. These are all types of the Antichrist. And it's just an amazing thing how, how God has put this uh, together to show us uh, the characteristics. And we get that because we, we, we've been studying Daniel. We, we already went through Revelation. Uh, we can sort of understand a little bit about this, uh, this leader that's going to come on the scene. And so it's easy to... It's easy to go to the Bible and to see the characteristics of the devil through his children. It just really is. And, um, but over here in 2 Samuel 15, and uh, verses uh, 2 to 6, 15 and verses 2 to 6, it says, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, it's talking about coming to David, then Absalom called on to him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man uh, deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice." And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And they all came to him and he allowed them to kiss his what? His hand. Okay? Now... Go over to uh, Daniel chapter 8. See, this is why when you know these things over years of studying your Bible and hearing it preached and all this stuff, you got all this stuff in your brain. Other people don't. And when you talk, it's like you're talking from another world. We're talking to even other Christians that don't study their Bible, never get anything else taught to them about anything. Just about. And uh, you come on the scene and you, you, you start telling him, oh, yeah, he's, he's almost like the Antichrist. What do you mean by that? And then you start telling him, well, he's a smooth talker, man. He's, you know, he's over here trying to win the hearts of everybody behind the back of uh, King David. And, and you know that Antichrist is going to be a smooth talker and he's going to convince a bunch of people. And what you could do there is you could make it a different, uh, a different uh, state of affairs. You could have somebody that's socialistic and and full of that kind of uh, uh, propaganda come in and try to uh, steal the power away from a government that has been uh, uh, brought up by a constitutional republic and with a Christian atmosphere. And uh, lo and behold, while they're asleep and not really thinking that this is, could ever happen in their country, they wake up one morning and lo and behold, their, their uh, liberties are gone. And nobody even fired a shot. And old Absalom's working his plan, isn't he? Because the same plan is the Antichrist. And that's that kind of attitude, that's that kind of help, I mean, that kind of uh, 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 attitude and, and motivation that he has. In Daniel chapter 8, uh, we see in verse uh, 25, 
the Bible says, and this is talking about the Antichrist here. We're talking about this ram, and you'd have to go through the whole chapter to see the context. You can read it on your own. Just check me out. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. It's all about him, right? And by what? Peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. We know who that is. You know the king of kings. But he shall be broken without a hand. I like that part. But the front part of that sounds just like the same spirit that Absalom has. And when you, when you take that uh, verse in Daniel chapter 11, go to 11 and verse 24. The Bible says this. He shall enter how? Huh? Peaceably. Even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, and yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And all these things are just little pieces of the puzzle of that tribulation period in the first three years, or three and a half years, as it's going to be a peace, peaceful takeover. And see, that's why a lot of the, I say brethren, because they're saved, they're going to heaven. But a lot of them believe in a, in a mid-trib thing, and that means that they're not, that we're going to be here. And if the rapture happens, it's going to happen after all this takes place, and when the great raft is poured out, where they can actually see it. So they believe that's when it takes place, you see. And uh, we don't believe that. We believe in a translation of the church before this takes place, because we see the rider in Revelation 6, 2, that has no arrows with his bow. We know from going to the book of Daniel that we see how he's going to peaceably take this thing over. And we know at the mid-trib, when that thing starts hitting the fan, it's going to be the desolation abomination talked about with Daniel when he crosses over and sets himself up as God in that temple. That's not a peaceful takeover, people. That's like a takeover, violently. So it's almost like I was, at the, um, I was at the synagogue today. Sure was. And uh, I'm taking a class, computers, amen. They like helping Gentiles out. And the lady was talking uh, to people that were there in our class, and she didn't quite know how the thing worked. And I have a Kohan there. He's about this big, about four foot, yarmulke. You know, his last name's Kohan. Okay, I mean, there's a lot of that going around in the Jewish community. You know, it's like bloodline or something. And he was sit, he was standing over there, and I says, "This is the deal. This is the real deal." And uh, she goes, well, "What's the real deal?" I says, "This is the deal. We believe the Messiah already came. They are waiting for the Messiah." And so he went like this. He smiled because he knew that's exactly right. That's that's the bottom line, right? And I went on to say. Because a lot of people, when they read the Bible, they don't read it openly. Because if they did, they could see that in Isaiah 53 and other places that he comes as a lamb first and then a lion. And then Mr. Cohen went a little bit like that. So we believe that he came as lamb. And we believe because of the resurrection it proved who he was. They are waiting for the lion to come to take over. And guess what? He is coming, I told her. And she goes, where's your church at? You know, I tell them, I tell everybody, you know, you get to talk to them. Everybody wants to come to our church. I don't know why they never come, but, you know, I wish they at least sent a check. You know, but because we know this stuff. I can take them to his Old Testament scriptures. I mean, I can, I can sit down with the rabbi. In his Old Testament, really can. They've got a lot, they got a ton of wisdom. They got in Proverbs, they, there's so much stuff in there like us, it's just amazing. I wouldn't argue with him, and he could even teach me some things from the wisdom of that book. 
But when it comes to the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, when it comes before that lamb that taketh upon the sins of the whole world, and they miss that, they missed it. So anyway, it's Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. That's what the tribulation period is. And from studying the tribulation, studying the horn, studying the, the governments with the, with the statue there, you know, with Nebuchadnezzar's dream and everything, going through all those kinds of things, we know without a doubt, Bible believers do, that this man that comes on the scene is going to be slick. He's going to be a common, uh, just a carbon copy of Jesus Christ. There's a whole lot of things there that he's going to do. And he's going to win the hearts of people. And the reason why we're going through these different characters in the Bible, because they have attributes of him. And if you, like they say, tag something, you know, put a word on, if I blog or something, put a, you know, a tag so people, if they ever put up kingdom or something, maybe it'll zip right over to one of my blogs or uh, Jeff's telling me all about these tags and stuff. Well, hey, I go to my Bible. You go to Strong's Concordance. I'm not talking about going to the Hebrew and Greek. I'm talking about just see where there's a word mentioned and trace the thing out. And uh, so with this Absalom, we're showing you a type here of the Antichrist. So he's going to have peace, and he's going to obtain this kingdom peaceably by flatteries. We saw that. And he rebels against David, and David in the Bible is a type of Christ. I mean, he's perfect in beauty, and I'll just hit some scriptures here. According to 2 Samuel 14, 25 and 26, and Ezekiel 28, 15, and he is hairy like Esau, <laughs> and hangs. And has a memorial built to himself. And when you look at all these characteristics. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me make that clear. That's not David now. I'm showing you David being a type of Christ. And then I went back to explain what happened to Absalom. He's hairy. And he hangs from a tree. Right? And cursed is everyone that what? Hangeth on a tree. Judas went out and did what? Hung himself. I mean, there's just... There's just so many scriptures. Somebody says, well, you guys, you just stretch scriptures. Well, think what you want. I just think about this. Are you learning anything? Uh, don't you see what the book of Revelation does to the Old Testament if you take it at face value? And um, it opens 39 books that otherwise are dead and gone. It unmasks the coming Christ who will pose as the Lord's Christ immediately preceding the second advent. <coughs> Boy, you use that Christ interchangeably. Yes, if you were here the other Wednesdays, you'd understand it just means anointed. And we see how God allowed different anointed people that were wicked and evil to exist and be part of that plan. And uh, the Antichrist is definitely the anointed one. He is. But he's not the anointed one. And um, so anyway, that was the type there. Then we have Saul, S-A-U-L. Remember him? He is demon-possessed. He's a rebel against God. He's a usurper of the priest's office. He's a popular idol, a hater of David, which is a type of Christ, and a tall man, according to 2 Thessalonians. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because we still are in, in uh, uh, these different types here. I mean, just, just the idea we got into the crux and the hex and all that stuff, I got excited over that stuff. I'm still thinking about how to use hexes um, that I've never uh, saw before. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses uh, 2 through 6. The Bible says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. As that day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he, he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And then it goes into the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And uh, so you have a, at the time of Saul, he was a popular idol. I think we went through him a little bit later. He was the people's choice, not God's choice. And he, they chose him because he, the whole world had somebody like him. Remember that? So they wanted a king because the whole world had one. And isn't that what the whole world's looking for right now? Come on. I mean, the Republican Party's even got a problem. They're trying to get one dude that they think can beat this other guy. Right? And eventually, guess who's going to come on the scene? They're going to have somebody that everybody agrees with. And if we're still here, we're going to say, are they crazy? Have they been out of their mind? Were they? They're going to have to compromise a little, ain't they? Uh, and man, it's going on now. Well, we see that in 2 Thessalonians. We're talking about, you know, he's a type of Christ. He was a tall man. And, and uh, go to Revelation chapter 13. Still talking about Saul. And we'll get to Goliath because he's a figure in there. Man, is he a tall man. And then uh, Ahab will take up most of our time. We'll go at all the scriptures with Ahab because, man, I'm telling you, whew, there's something about Ahab. But over here in Revelation chapter 13, it's easy to... to uh, uh, when somebody says, what about the Antichrist? You say, oh, Revelation 13. You just run, you know, 13, and maybe you'll have a reference Bible. And, and, and let me mention this. I know there's probably other people listening. But uh, Re uh, Ruckman does have a reference Bible. Uh, his notes and everything, to me, sometimes are a little bit much, confusing a little bit. But, you know, if you went through all of them, I imagine uh, what, a, what a, you know, degree you might have. The appendix, though, the, the back of his Bible, tremendous information. Uh, but there is a reference Bible out. It's a Hoffman Bible. H-O-F-F-M-A-N. Uh, -F -F I told my boys I need to get it. reason is it's analytically put together. It's simple footnoted. It's called the Common Man Bible. It was put out before Dr. Ruckerman ever did. This fellow's like 50, and he's, believe it or not, he's a Jack Hiles graduate. Yeah. And, uh, but it's dispensational also. It's got a balance on the Greek manuscripts. It's got all this stuff. So, so what I'm saying is it's um, called the Hoffman Reference Bible. So if you're hearing me teaching now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get me one. Uh, you know, I've got a Schofield. I've got a Thompson Chain. I've got, uh, I've got a Rice Bible. It tells me I'll be able to, if I'm a good boy, I'll be able to go in New Jerusalem and eat from the fruit and everything like I need it. But, I mean, at least I know it's what he wrote and it's in there, what he believed, Right. Uh, you get a lot of crazy ideas when you mess with that King James Bible. But anyway, I got one of those, and uh, a lot of them in my... You say, why do you do that, preacher? I, I love it. I love the Word of God. I like to see what other men have to say about it. And Well, can't you just... I know, I know, I know, I know. But this one here, at least if you had folks like you all, common folks, right? Uh, you have to work. You have to do pay bills. You're... Us as preachers, we just lay around, eat bonbons, and study the Word of God all day. I mean, what a blessing that is. We get paid the big bucks. Uh, just a tremendous blessing to be in the ministry. Uh, so anyway, if you, had a, if you had a Bible like that, then at least wherever you were at, at work or whatever, right, you'd go to the notes, and you could do that, and you'd learn something. You really would. And guess what? He believes the King James Bible is the Word of God. I mean, just that's a, that's a bonus, and uh, you say, are you promoting that? Yeah, I'm promoting it. They promote their stuff, I promote our stuff. Amen. But I, th I don't think you'd go wrong on it. That's all I'm saying. So that's called the Hoffman Reference Bible, and it's, I forgot if it was through, uh, um, they got a website anyway. Google it and you'll, you'll get it. So where was I at before I really interrupted myself? Revelation chapter 13, and um, <clears throat> we're under Saul here. So verses 3 through 6. And this is what's interesting, because if you remember when we were back there, somebody had a head wound besides Sisera. Remember, there's other people that had a head wound. Remember, Abimelech had a head wound. Remember, he hated God's people. See, this is what I want you to see. He hated God's people. He did all the characteristics of the Antichrist because of that spirit. 
So now we're talking about who? Saul. Now look in verse 3 to 6. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay? So we know that there's a wound in the head, and it's serious enough for everybody to believe that you should die. But he's healed. All right? And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him, now look what it says, please, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against who? God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell where? In heaven. This is a literal dude, man. That's going to be empowered. Powerful. And these people say, well, when we see him, we're just going to go get our weapons and we're going to go hide here and there. Man, I talked to my Tim about stuff. I talked about how they went over in the mountains. I mean, where are you going to hide, man? I mean, them Afghans, I'm telling you what, they withstood how many armies because they're mountains. And uh, we come over there, shoot a little laser beam right at the door, you know, of the cave, and that's all she wrote. Everything in there is gone. No air anymore. I mean, and me and you is going to run where? Where exactly are we running now? How are we going to hide? Well, I'm going to take a bunch with me. They're pretty slick, these people. Now, in America, they're going to have a problem. That's why they're working slow with us. And that's why I think God's just being merciful and long so some of our kids can get saved, grandkids can get saved. You know, he's merciful and long-suffering. But God does say he draws all nations to that battle. To me, all is A-L-L. So there's something going to happen. And if this dude here is who the Bible claims him to be, and he can have a rap like they say on the streets, I mean, everybody's going to fall at his feet. He's going to be Mr. Miracle Worker. And as soon as you doubt it, man, there's going to be a prophet. What's he going to do, call fire down from heaven? I mean, I only saw that back in the 60s on drugs. I mean, if, you, if some dude walked out here and all of a sudden he says, I got power, and he started telling me what I was thinking and what I did before and nobody else knew about it and, and started running all that stuff, and then <laughs> the stuff started coming down. Now, I'm warned now. I mean, I'm warned and, and I'm saved, so I know I ain't buying this. I ain't buying Jesus coming in my room either, 6 foot, 10 feet, 12, 20 foot. I understand what the Bible says about these kinds of apparitions, all right? But now these people, when we're out of here, oh, come on. Whew. Right now, if somebody came to Michigan, give everybody like 10 grand each just to get you off your, you know, you know, get you, we'd follow them probably somewhere if we thought it wasn't bad, you know. <laughs> yeah, we would. So here at any rate, you see this right from the Bible. You see Thessalonians, you see Revelations, you see all these other verses. Then you go to Goliath, and I told you some of these verses we'll just skim over. But in Goliath, you got a tall man. He is killed by a wound where? In the head. <laughs> Definitely lost his head. Goliath comes from Hamitic background. That means from Ham. Exactly as Nimrod. Exactly as Balak. Exactly as Pharaoh. Whoa, what's happening here? Is there a line here? Is there some consistency going on? And, uh, and you, can, you can just go to Genesis 10, verses 6 and 14 for the, the, you know, the Nimrod deal. And uh, he has six pieces of armor, according to 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. And he is killed by David, which is a type of who? Christ. You know, what's his number? I mean, the... the I'm, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, there's just too much stuff in here that's coincidental. Now we get to number 10, Gentile number, Ahab. He's a wicked prince of Israel. Go to Ezekiel 21.
Ezekiel 21. Ezekiel 21 and verse 25 and 27. The Bible says this, And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Whoa! Who's doing the talking? God is. Mm. Is it talking about the Messiah coming? Sure is. Are we talking about Ahab being a type? Man, we sure are. Did you know that Ahab is a wicked prince of Israel, just like the Antichrist is going to be? And did you know that he marries a Phoenician Baal worshiper? First Kings. You know, some of this stuff, I know you've been out of your Bible for a while, especially my kids, but did you hear what I says? He marries a Baal worshiper. I mean, it'll 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 come to you a little bit here. Okay, you got second well first Kings rather. First Kings chapter sixteen. First Kings chapter sixteen and verse thirty one. The Bible says, and it came to pass, I believe that's it, isn't it? First Kings 16, 31. It's talking about the ascension of Ahab over Israel and he married Jezebel. Okay, 31. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, what's when you start going through Ahab, him being a wicked prince over Israel, and he has that allegiance that he becomes one flesh with that woman, that Phoenician, that Baal worshiper, oh boy. You know who he's opposed by? He's opposed by the herald of truth. You know who that is? Elijah. You say, well, what are you talking about? The Antichrist is connected with the whore in the book of Revelation, which is connected with Baal worship. And the prophet, you got Moses, remember the two witnesses? This is before the second advent, when Christ comes back with the church to take over. It's going to happen, just like I just said. And when you, when you, and I'm not done with this Ahab thing, because, I mean, anybody can say this, right? Baal worship, and how do you connect Baal worship with the Pope of Rome, you know? You know, and then we go to two Babylons, right? That's a book by Hislop. They can argue a lot of stuff, but that guy was a historian, man. I mean, he, he dug up some stuff that they wish was never dug up. So they keep fighting it, you know? And most of their own people don't even know their own history and what it's, what it's went to. But at any rate, this ain't all. So he, uh, he is opposed, who is Ahab, by who? Well, this, this herald of Elijah. Ahab has priests who wear vestments and come from the apostate tribe of Dan. And you know what they called the priest? Guess. They're wearing vestments like priests. You ever go in the Old Testament and find out they look like somebody else that runs around here? Their vestments? You, anybody want to guess what they call the priest? Father. Preacher, you don't. You, 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 come on. Go to Judges 17. Remember they had judges before they had kings? Judges. 
Judge 17. Judges 17. Because what we're concerned with is these Baal worshipers, right? Who they are, how they dress. Why? Because it's the religion that Ahab married into. He's got an alliance with them. So over here in Judges 17, verses 1 through 3, And there was a man, Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. Micah's, uh, this is talking about self-will. We're just getting there. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, or, yeah, cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it, and his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a what? Huh? A graven image. Whoa! When you first read this, you thought it was a good thing, didn't you? Sounded good. He was honest. What, what, right? I mean, he paid, played a little honesty. But look what mom was doing. From my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it on to thee. Right? And look at verses 5 to 7. Or verse 5. Go to verse 5. And the man Micah had a house of what? God's. And made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Do you see this? Okay. Now 7 through 13, verses 7 through 13. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn uh, where he could find a place. And it came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a, a what? A father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the uh, by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Look at verse thirteen. Remember, it ends verse thirteen. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a what? Levite to my priest. How many of you all know the Bible enough to know that this guy's in trouble? How many of you know the Bible enough to know that this light, Levite? Whoa, something wrong with this Levite. Okay, just so you know that. Now, in chapter 18, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the what? Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. Look at verse 6. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord is your way, wherein you go. Okay. And then, let me see if I'm getting this right. This one six, Verse 14 to 25. I'm trying to move it quickly here. Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country <clears throat> of Laish, and said unto their brethren, Do you know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and graven image and a molten image? Now therefore consider what ye have to do. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. And six hundred Men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of who? Now, why am I making this Dan a big deal? Because he's associated with the Antichrist. And we're seeing how Ahab is, Ahab is a type, and how he married this Baal worshiper, and how the, we're, what we're going through now is seeing how these priests started this thing. And if you remember the book of Revelation, we did that extensively with Jezebel. Covered her name, I mean Jezebel. I mean, Baal. <laughs> anyway, okay. So the children of Dan stood by entering of the gate, 
And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, teraphim, the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, What do ye? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us. And be to us a what? Father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in where? Israel. See, you seeing the connection with the Jew now? Okay. And the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went to the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle in the carriage and before them. And when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? And he said, Ye have taken away my gods which I made, and the priest, and ye are gone away, and what have I more? And what is this that ye may say unto me? What aileth thee? And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life with the lives of thy household. And the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back into his house. So now we see how this Dan thing got going, and uh, where their heart was at. And all because we're talking about this, this Ahab has priests who wore vestments and come from the apostate tribe of Dan, who called the priest father. These priests hold services, usually from 11 to noon, on the day of the sun god, Sunday, and worship Baal by penitential acts of self-mutilation. Has anybody ever saw any movies about what happens in South America, what the Catholics do over there? I wonder how it never comes here, why the Pope never condemned that. Doing indulgences and beating themselves for their sin, doing penance. They beat until their backs turn red and blood flows. You know, Mardi Gras, right? I mean, why don't they condemn that sin, that fornication, that whoremongering, that queer stuff, that drinking, that debauchery, all everything that God's against? Why, why don't the Pope get up and say, you fools, don't do that? Because he's got them under control. Because then they have to make amends for their dirty little cells, and they get Ash Wednesday, little ashes on their forehead. They mark, they curse themselves, the Bible says with that mark. Where did they, they put it? On their forehead. What's that associated with? Catholic Church. What does the whore have in Revelations? What's her vesture? What's the symbol? Golden cup, their chalice. You know, the Holy Grail, we laugh about, we watch all these movies about, oh, it's, a, it's, it's got powers, it's what Jesus drank out of. Anyway, I find this interesting that in my Bible, it covers everything like this. I mean, it sort of proves to me that God's like outside of this thing. So he must really be real. And he's giving me a book and he's telling me everything that's going on. If you just open up your eyes. And the reason why other people cannot open their eyes is because they're blind, because the glorious gospel has never shined into them. So they can have a bunch of facts in their head, but nothing can jail, nothing goes together. There's no spirit behind it. It's like when we're talking truth in here, your head all of a sudden, boing, boing, boing. That's right. You just know it's right. You got the book. You got the Holy Ghost of God. So while everybody's looking in one way, they're making their move. And First Kings again. Go to First Kings, chapter eighteen. First Kings, chapter eighteen. You know who the herald is, right? Remember Elijah? Remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you remember Ahab is the Antichrist, right? And you remember his priests, right? And what did his priests do? Remember that? Okay, 1 Kings 18, let's look at verse 17. 
It says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> like he didn't know. Verse 27. Look at verse 27. We've got to move on. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Look what they do. Verse 28. And they cried aloud, and they did what? Cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. What a sick church. And you go to reading the stuff they did to Christians through the centuries and how they did the Inquisition and what they did them sick puppies. And, and, and you know what he says? Oh, we're sorry we did that. Can we be friends again? That's the nature of the animal, man. You know what they're going to do to us when they take over? Lord have mercy, people. So, anyway. Hello, Rome. <laughs> That's what it means. How did you get in there? Well, further, furthermore, they honor, see, we're not done with Ahab and his priest. Go to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah 44. If you don't think it's a good study, I get goose pimples over this, man. Well, don't it scare you? Not anymore. I mean, what are you going to do about it? You know, if we believe in God, he's in charge of everything, isn't he? I mean, he's letting us live as long as we're living. If we're preaching the truth and it upsets somebody, well, glory to God then. Right? Now, in Jeremiah 44, Jeremiah 44, <laughs> this is good, man. Jeremiah 44, let's look at verse 14, shall we? Verse 14. The Bible says, so that none of the remnant of Judah which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, shall escape or remain, that they should remain into the land of Judah, to the which they have a desire to return to dwell there, for none shall return but such as shall escape. So we're seeing something going on here, and this is the, this is the, the Jew in Egypt, you know, it's a message like that God the type when you read the whole thing. But we're not done yet. Look at verse 19. There's a reason. Why God's bringing judgment. And when we burned incense to the what? Queen of heaven. Did God tell him to do that? I didn't know there was a queen. I mean, I know who the king of kings is. But guess what? There ain't no queen of heaven. All right, now just look. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings onto her, did we make her cakes to what? Worship her and pour out drink offerings onto her without our men. <laughs> hmm. Look at look at verse twenty eight. I can't read every verse. Go to twenty eight uh, uh, thirty one. I think is that what it is? Are we in Jeremiah here. I'm sorry. We were in forty four, right? And I went to 14. I read 14, right? Okay, did I read uh, 19? Okay, then we just got to read 25. Yeah, 25 is the last one for that one. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Who's talking to them? The Lord is. He's telling them what they said was their vows, and they made vows to the Queen of Heaven. And they made little cakes to her, to worship. And... Um, so, so, so far, Ahab, right? He's a wicked prince. He marries a Baal worshiper. Uh, he opposes uh, the, the herald, which is Elijah. Uh, his priests wear vestments and come from the apostate tribe of Dan, who called the priest father. These priests hold services. They're sun god worshipers, that's what they are. And they worship Baal by 
penitential acts of self-mutilation. Right? And further than that, they honor the queen of heaven with wafers. And as Phoenicians, they come from Ham, according to Genesis 10, verses 19 on. Because Sidon and Zidion, uh, in 1 Kings 16, tells you that's what it is. So they're black like Ham. Come from Jewish stock, Dan. He is a son, you know. Remember the 12 tribes? So now we got a mixture. So now we're starting to see a little bit more of the leopard action. We're seeing all three races mixed in one. Don't it make sense? Bring everybody together, make our own tower. Why shouldn't the leader be of three? I mean, I'm telling you what, people. To me, it's exciting stuff. Now, next Wednesday, if somebody don't get a hold of this and put a hit on me, called Jesuit, you know, um, we'll hit on Jeroboam. Oh, yeah, man, because we've got to get to the kiss. Then we got Nabal, we got Sennacherib, we got Nebuchadnezzar. Man, we got Haman. You know Haman? Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. And you're not going to believe this. We've got Solomon. And Solomon's number is 666. Preacher, you're out of your mind. Yeah, I know. Then we got Herod. And then we're going to go to Judas. Man, we got a load of stuff on Judas. Oh, buddy. <sighs> so, what are we doing? We're finding out all about the man, right? Then after we get done with that, then we're going to find out about the number, the name, the sign, and his mark. Still under, don't you shut that tape off yet. Still under, still under Baptist distinctives. I never got that in my college. We had seven things. We, they spelled out Baptist, you know. And I know, but there's other stuff to this. Because when it talks about Scripture, what do you believe about Scripture? Right? And then in, in teaching Scripture, there are some Baptists that believe in division. I'm one of them. And they got to love me because the whole theme about being a Baptist is I have my conscience. And I have my dictates from the Word of God as they do. And if they don't like it, that's their baby and that's their Baptist thing. You know, if they got pink buses, I don't like it. I can't stand it. You know, another preacher may have blue ones. I like them buses better. We don't have any buses. If you want us to have us a bus, send us a driver, send us a bus, send us money for the gas and the insurance. I got no problem with that. We'll work something out. Amen. But uh, so Baptist distinctives, after we're done with the scripture, and we know with the division part, because the other ones will move fairly quick. We're not going to spend time in the law and all that. We did this years ago. But I mean, at least we know that Abraham's coming up next, right? That's a good thing, isn't it? Abraham's coming up next. And he has promise. And you can't get away from the types and the figures and just the, even the way the canon of our Bible is put together. You'll see God in it. Right? Oh, man. It's, and see, even though everybody else in the world don't see that, if there's just six of us that see it, we got something they ain't got. And it encourages us. And that's what makes the difference between those that stand and those that fall. Is how much are you loaded with? Because if you're loaded with a whole lot, chances are you got more of a devil battle on you. you got more of a devil battle, if you do fall, you're going to get up quicker. Because you understand the battle. And the wars, the wars are already won by the Lord. Amen? So, that's it for now on that subject.